um, the Universidad de Albert Einstein, and he has two sisters, and he's married to Veronica Ayala. Francisco is the executive director at CRISPAS, and he has worked at CRISPAS since 2009. So, um, opening the floor for Trina and Kevin or Francisco. And thank you guys for coming today. Thank you. Thank you, Aria. And thank you for the invitation. We're very excited to be here with you all, and especially around a very, uh, I think, significant uh, time for not only Salvadorans, but many people who uh, live a life of social justice and a life that, that uh, is inspired in, in individuals like the ones we are remembering today, um, the six Jesuits and Selena and Elba that were assassinated uh, 31 years ago, almost to the day. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's nice to be in a uh, in a place where I can see people's faces and not 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 the masks, right? You know, so it's, it's good to see people's teeth. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, would have preferred to have been in in, in you know in, in the same room with you all, but this is what we have right now. So I am coming to you from El Salvador. Uh, just excited to be with you. So I will share my screen here so we can get started. One second, please. Okay. Well, good, good evening again. Um, like it was said, uh, and as you can also see in, in, in the Zoom uh, window there, my name is Francisco Mena Aguarte. Uh, I was only six years old when a civil war began in my country. It lasted 12 years, and it claimed the lives of 75,000 people. After the war, the United Nations Truth Commission documented the atrocities that had been committed during the war. The commission's report was a chilling amount, account of repression against the people by the government and the military. There were two particular cases that shook the conscience of the world. The assassination of Archbishop Romero in 1980 and the assassination of the Jesuit fathers and their domestic employees that was ordered by the Army High Command. On November 16, 1989, shortly after midnight, a group of elite soldiers entered the campus of the Jesuit University in San Salvador. Some of them had been trained at the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. They took the Jesuits from their rooms and forced them li to lie down in the garden outside. They shot them point blank in the head. Then they executed a Salvadoran mother and daughter who were sleeping in guest room nearby. Who were the six men and two women? These, these two, six men and two women. I think Sabrina puts it very, very, uh, very clearly and, and, and without having to go around too much and explaining who they were. Uh, he managed to escape uh, the same fate as his Jesuit brothers because he was away giving a lecture in, in scripture in Thailand. But he described them simply as humans trying to be humans, Christians trying to be Christians, Jesuits trying to be Jesuits, and most importantly, Salvadorans trying to be Salvadorans. They were real people like you and me. They were extremely committed to what they were doing. They were committed to the poor and the powerless in El Salvador. Why were the Jesuits assassinated? These Jesuits were assassinated for their unwavering commitment to the impoverished and oppressed. They were assassinated because of their commitment to the preferential option for the poor. But these ideas, these ideas cannot be killed, especially when these ideas express resolute aspirations to work for peace with justice. In the past 11 years, as executive director of CRISPAS, I've witnessed how the example of the Salvadoran martyrs has shaken and inspired the lives of so many participants on our delegations. 
I would like to suggest that what the Jesuit martyrs offer us today is a powerful message of radical hope and prophetic action. So what does radical hope mean? What does it look like? What does it feel like? The people of El Salvador have helped me answer these questions. I've had the good fortune to sit in front of radical hope. That is, I've had the honor of meeting a courageous group of women called the Comadres, the Committee of Mothers of the Disappeared. The committee was formed by mothers whose sons and daughters had been captured by El Salvador's death squads. To this day, the majority of them have never been found. Their children were being persecuted for publicly protesting the injustices of the military regime. These mothers encountered lies, violence, and death as they searched for their sons and daughters. Some of them ended up being tortured themselves. These mothers encountered lies, violence, excuse me, and, and torture themselves. <coughs> Mother Alicia was one of the founders of Comadres. She lost two sons. One was 16 years old, the other only 12. Her daughter was raped and tortured and she herself was captured when she was only five months pregnant. The torture that put, they put her through was so violent that she ended up having a miscarriage in prison. They kept on denouncing the injustices and accompanying other mothers with a radical persistent hope that they would be heard and that they would find their children. What made their hope radical wasn't just what they hoped for. It wasn't what it's, what, it was what inspired it, what grounded it, what enabled them to believe that things could be different. Certainly what inspired them and what inspires anyone who has hope is something we feel in ourselves and in our humanity. But at the same time, it is more than that. It is something that enables us to hope when humanly speaking, there's no reason to hope. This is when we realize that when we connect with the depths of our humanity, we are connecting with something more than we understand humanity to be. Radical hope opens us to what the Jesuits would call the spirit, the spirit that acts in and through our humanity. And so for these mothers, radical hope was never about doing something that was sure to have results. It was about not giving up. It was about doing what was right simply because it was right. Hope in such desperate situations can only be radical hope. The six Jesuits were close to people like these mothers, people who made them more human. They came to know and see the unjust reality that most people in El Salvador were living with. Under Yacuria, the vision of the university started to have a change uh, and have a preferential option for the poor. Three things changed because of this. First, the university existed to serve the majority of the Salvadorans who were suffering from inhumane conditions. This meant that its social outreach decidedly oriented the work of the UCA. The UCA didn't exist, exist for itself or its members only. Its center was not within itself as well, its students or its professors, nor its authorities. Second, the UCA always went about its work precisely as a university, analyzing the reality and the causes of the oppression and developing ideas and theoretical models for a more humane and humanizing structure. Third, the UCA's Christian inspiration drew attention to secular and religious values consistent with Christian faith. The UCA's objective was to analyze the different causes that it that explained the tragic situation of what was going on and suggest the most humane and viable paths toward a, toward a peaceful solution. The UCA will, would unveil the truth, gathering information, excuse me, gathering information and analyzing the violation of human rights and those responsible for those violations. The Jesuits intentionally, purposefully, and passionately addressed the specific causes of the injustice existing at the time. And that meant challenging the status quo. 
The memory of our martyrs fills our history with their light, but these memories can also be dangerous in the sense that they call upon us, or better yet, they demand of us that we carry on. When we remember these people, <coughs> excuse me, when we remember these people, we, when we remember what these people have lived and died for, we find ourselves in power to follow their example and to hope even when there seems no reason to hope. But how can we sustain this radical hope and prophetic action? Here the Jesuits would remind us of the need for contemplation. We, we nurture our radical hope in our spirituality, in our prayer life, and what we call the mystical awareness of the spirit that we feel in private meditation or in community gatherings and prayer. We need contemplation to sustain both radical hope and prophetic action. The ability to hope and keep acting when the opposition is overwhelming and nothing seems to change, this comes out of faith, out of what we feel inside ourselves together with others in a community. We sustain each other in this inner conviction <clears throat> that comes out of our connectedness with the energy and the spirit that animated Jesus. Such spirit energy leads us to prophetic action that may require that we make political choices and take positions. This is something that's so difficult to do nowadays when we're told not to mix politics with religion or when we confuse disagreeing with being disagreeable. To follow the example of the Jesuits and Monsignor Romero and, the so, many, and so many other Salvadoran martyrs is to commit ourselves to a path of radical hope and prophetic action. It is a path on which our action will be sustained by our spirituality and our spirituality will call us to further action. When we respond, when we respond to issues such as immigration, racial, racial discrimination and climate change, we are responding to those who cry out for justice. It is an example of how Christians are to follow Jesus in today's world, a world in which millions of people are suffering. As Christians, we must recognize that we live in a world filled with numerous groups and communities facing systematic oppression, and we must act. We have to be willing to identify and engage the complex realities within our world that create such problems. To commit ourselves to radical hope and prophetic action is a matter of who we are as disciples and followers of Jesus. It's not a liberal cause or a populist agenda or a mainstream fad. It is a deeply spiritual practice. The dangerous memories of our Jesuit martyrs of Romero and so many Salvadoran martyrs transcends borders and calls us all forward. We cannot do otherwise. Thanks, Francisco. Um, and maybe just to take like, if we could take like 10 seconds and just kind of sit with, I don't want to transition too quickly because Francisco shared a lot, um, but maybe just to kind of like take 10 seconds and then uh, I'll start with the, the second part here. Okay, um, so, um, you know, it's really great to be part of this community uh, here this evening. And uh, thanks so much to Roxanne and Vanessa and Ari, um, Aria for, and the whole, you know, uh, Center for Community-Based Learning team for uh, putting this together. Um, we're very grateful, uh, Trina and I, to, to be with you uh, this evening. Um, and a real, um, you know, it's great to be doing this with you, Francisco. Um, every time I hear you talk, I'm really moved at the core. Uh, and I think you and the work that you do uh, at Crispas is just, um, you know, in, in true solidarity with the Salvadoran people. And you've done such an amazing job over so many years of providing spaces for 
students and faculty groups from the United States to come down on your delegations. Um, so I look forward to the day when we can be in the same room together, uh, and not virtually, but it is great to be with you on this panel tonight. Um, I do want to give a shout out. Last year in J uh, January, I believe, Vanessa, you came down with a group of Fordham students, right? So I didn't know if any of the Fordham students were going to be on this panel, but if any of you are out there, just a shout out. Uh, all right, Maddie. Yeah, all right. And Alia, oh, so good to see you again. All right, good. Um, it's a humbling topic, you know, to be um, reflecting on and contemplating the history of the Salvadoran martyrs. Um, and, you know, this time in November is the time when we, across the Jesuit schools here and internationally, really try to take time and, and commemorate that. So, um, yeah, Tree and I, for, uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, for the, you know, about 20 years we were working receiving students for a semester uh, in Salvador. And uh, actually, I think some of our alums are on the call as well. Um, it was such a, a, an amazing work. When we talked about, when Trina, Francisco, and I talked about like how to make use of this time tonight, it kind of felt to me to, to, with the challenge of reflecting a little bit, and there'll be echoes with what Francisco already shared, but like the context of El Salvador in that time, and what could be some things for us to think about in this context, you know, in the United States, um, here in the Bronx. So um, I offered to you, as I thought through this, um, kind of four main ideas or areas. Um, the first one, and Francisco mentioned this, is this, the importance of accompaniment. So if you, if you listen to what Francisco was saying, the Jesuits uh, were, um, became so passionate with their mission because they were really walking in solidarity with the people of El Salvador. You know, they knew that reality. Oftentimes we have this image of kind of like higher education, with like the, the ivory tower, you know, that's not how they operated. They were in solidarity accompanying the people. And in this context, it was really a crucified people. And in doing that, that, is, that was the first step. So I kind of like throw that out there for thinking about okay, what could be some parallels? I would make the case that really the first step is like, where can we encounter those in our own context who are on the margin, who are the most marginalized, the poor, those who are excluded, right? Um, my friend, Steve Prevett, he's a Jesuit who, uh, the president of a Cristo Ray school in uh, Los Angeles. He would oftentimes, when he would come down to Salvador, he would talk to students and he would, kind of getting this point of like, we're much more likely to live ourselves into new ways of thinking than to think ourselves into new ways of living, right? And he would give the example, if you imagine, you probably in the movies, you've all seen um, the, the image in Rio de Janeiro of the Jesus up there, you know, and they kind of have like the drones going by and it's a beautiful image of Rio de Janeiro. And then he would say like, okay, from that perspective, this is how everything looks. But imagine now that you're placed in one of the favelas, you know, the world is going to look very, very different, you know, and I think kind of playing off that accompaniment piece that the Jesuits were walking in the reality and that inspired. So again, kind of like uh, bringing home that, that point of accompaniment. And actually, this is what I think the Center for Community Based Learning is the biggest gift to Fordham, because that is what it's trying to do, right, to, to bring these connections to allow students and faculty to encounter different realities nationally and internationally. Um, point two, so the first one is accompaniment. The second one, integration with academics, right? So I think, um, you know, the Jesuits were killed because of the way they imagined what it meant to be a university and how they then acted that out, right? The bombs started going off on campus when they started producing hardcore social analysis about the reality of the context of, of, of the time. Um, and as Francisco mentioned, Ella Correa would always say, la UCA tiene su centro afuera de sí. The center of the, I mean, the center of the university is really outside of itself. Which is, so Ella Correa was the president of the school, right? So it, it's pretty radical idea, right? The center of the university is really outside of itself. Um, so I think that gets at the importance of integrating the academic piece. 
um, and how that and how doing that accompaniment piece will influence our academic research, scholarship, um, and teaching. Third point, and Francisco emphasized this too, is contemplation and prayer. You know, the Jesuits had access to this rich Ignatian tradition, which as you all know is, you know, boredom is part of this kind of really rich tradition. Certainly there's lots of different ways to contemplate and to pray, different faith traditions, um, but I think kind of like, again, trying to make some connections between the context of the Uca and El Salvador and here, that piece is, is I think, front and center. And lastly, uh, point number four would be the community aspect, right? So the Jesuit community at the Uca, if you, uh, you get to know like the different Christian-based communities, community is a huge, huge emphasis, not only in El Salvador, but in Latin America. And I think that's something that um, with our transition now recently here to the Bronx, we're gonna be curious to see kind of like the different emphasis uh, with that, but certainly in the context of the UCA, and I think, uh, you know, we're feeling that, especially with COVID, the need for connecting, you know, with one another. Um, so the community piece is also, uh, also important. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna turn it over to Trina, and I'm actually gonna give her, we're sharing these, earbud things, uh, but I'm going to give these to so that she has a good sense. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting us in on this panel this evening. Um, it's, it's really special for us to be here tonight, especially it's the first time in 20 years that we are not in El Salvador um, celebrating the legacy of the martyrs. So it's, it's difficult to be so far away, but I'm really grateful that we're finding ways that we can connect with our Salvadoran martyrs, with our Salvadoran partners and friends like Francisco and Rafa. Um, and I just have to have a shout out. I'm really glad to see that our, two of our daughters, Sophie and Gracie have joined with us from California. So thanks girls. Um, so Kevin, you know, he, he ended the talk talking about the importance of community and the importance of having good companions. And the work that we did in El Salvador, you know, when we went, it was going to be for two years. Well, we threw a zero on the end of that and we stayed for 20. And I think one of the biggest reasons was because we had such great companions, um, people who are working in NGOs, our community partners, students over the years who came down to study abroad in, in the CASA program. And then in the last two years that we were in El Salvador, our energy shifted, our attention shifted to working directly with Salvadoran students who studied at the UCA. And I actually think that Adri and Ale are on this talk with us tonight as well. Um, so that's really what has been such an important part of the work that we've done in El Salvador and what the Salvadorans have taught us, the importance of community um, and the importance of authentic relationships. So what we wanted to do tonight, rather than for us to keep talking is looking at, so we've talked about the history of El Salvador. We've talked about the legacy of the martyrs. We've talked about what this means um, in the historical context, and we wanted to get some young Salvadoran students to share with us, what does this mean for them? So we've asked three students, we've asked Adri um, and Nelson and Ale, and you'll see in the slideshow that they're, they're what they studied um, at, at the UCA. And the question that we posed for them is, um, given the legacy of the martyrs, what does that tell us about Jesuit higher education today. And I think that's all kind of, for all of us here on the, on the call, that's a common thread that we all have is both of those things, right? What is this legacy of the martyrs? How is it still alive today? And then what does that mean for those of us who are working in the context of Jesuit higher education or studying at Jesuit universities? Um, so I am going to, and I just have to have a shout out to Rafa. Thank you so much for helping getting the translation, the subtitles onto the screen. Um, they go a little fast because uh, they, they had a lot to say and they knew they didn't have a whole lot of time. So I think they're, they're, they're fitting a lot in and a little bit of time and they just, just really pay attention to what it is they have to say about their Jesuit education and what the martyrs mean in that context. I mean, they're just nuggets of wisdom all over the place. So play, pay close attention. Are we can are we on? Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
we don't have sound. Kevin. No sound. What's what's going on? When when you share the screen, there are two little uh, boxes that you have to click on the left side, at the bottom left, that enables audio to be shared as well. Here, here, here. Can, I'm uh, sorry, can click, you say it again? Because I have. <laughs> yeah. Stop. Stop sharing for a second. Yep. Okay. We stop sharing. All right. Yep. Now, when you share again, click share once, and then you'll see two little boxes on the left side for the audio. Click both and then share. Yeah. And then share. Uh, we don't have the desktop there, do we? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Can you find yeah, now we're good. We're good. There. Got it. Share, share, share. Share. All right. Can you start over? Um, Okay, we're going to try again. Como ex estudiante de la Universidad Centroamericana José Simeón Cañas, considero que la educación jesuita ha sido un pilar fundamental en mi formación, ya que ha inspirado el rumbo que quiero tomar en mi vida, así como también a lo que quiero enfocar mi carrera ya que en sus aulas me enseñaron a pensar y analizar en la realidad desde una perspectiva crítica, así como también a conocer de primera mano las carencias, necesidades, pero sobre todo el valor y la esperanza que hay alrededor del pueblo salvadoreño. Esto por medio de formación en derechos humanos, espiritualidad ignaciana, ética, pero sobre todo en el acompañamiento a comunidades que enfrentan situaciones difíciles y también gracias al ejemplo de Monseñor Romero y nuestros mártires que con cuyo legado e imagen siguen inspirando y alentando nuestros corazones hacia la búsqueda de una sociedad más justa y humana. Es por esto que considero que las universidades jesuitas deben enfocar sus esfuerzos en transmitir estos valores a todos y cada uno de los estudiantes que atraviesen sus puertas para que así no solo formen profesionales capaces, sino también seres humanos conscientes y comprometidos con la sociedad que les rodea. I think the importance of the Jesuit education is that it connects the reality itself with the academic aspect. I do think that Right now it's more subtle, but back then when we had our civil war, when human rights were being violated, the Jesuits were the only ones talking about it in the academic field. They developed this model for this university, which was solely centered on social change. And also they cemented the way for academic analysis of the social reality that it's being used even today. I think that's really powerful because they became this living proof that the academic field can have an impact on this social construct. And that's when we have to talk about the role of the university in this regard. It has to be a safeguard for people to talk, to discuss ideas. It has to be a place where it's being analyzed, the social, the economic, the political climate of the country. It has to be this, because if not there, where? It has to be a non-biased resource for people to gather information, for people to find research about things that they are not knowledgeable about. And that's one of the biggest things that the martyrs left us, is that commitment to the truth. They did it even when their lives were at stake. So for the university, it has to be there. That seek of the truth has to be there even when the government is opposing it, even when there's a lot of discomfort about the things that they're saying. It has to be there. It has to always seek that truth.
Como estudiante de una universidad jesuita, nunca esperé interesarme en la realidad de injusticia social en la que mi país, El Salvador, vive como consecuencia de su historia tan golpeada y actualmente ignorada, aun cuando nuestro entorno pide a gritos auxilio. Gracias al Centro Ignacio Yacuría conocí acerca de los mártires de la UCA, quienes inmersos en esta historia lucharon por la justicia social y el bien común hasta la muerte. Creo firmemente que de haber elegido otra universidad para mi formación, no estaría interesada ni me sentiría responsable por unirme en esta lucha, como tampoco habría tenido las experiencias de acercamiento a comunidades y a la historia nacional de mi país, que transformarían la orientación que en algún momento pensé para mis estudios profesionales. A mi parecer, las universidades jesuitas a nivel mundial tienen el deber de continuar el camino de justicia que su fundador, así como nuestros mártires, han iniciado, concientizando y trabajando por esta justicia y formando a profesionales que no solo estén interesados en su bienestar propio, sino que busquen contribuir desde sus posibilidades y educación profesional a la construcción de una mejor sociedad. Hablo de despertar corazones solidarios y conscientes, de pasar del yo a nosotros, de ser capaces de compartir la mesa viendo en todos a un hermano, de no normalizar las injusticias y de actuar en favor de los olvidados. Esa es la orientación jesuita que espero en mis estudios, que junto a mis compañeros pueda decir con firmeza, entramos para aprender, salimos para servir. All right, so I think with that, um, just, you know, in listening to Francisco talk and, and Kevin share, and then listening to the students, all the themes that they touched on that you talked about, right? They talked about the hope and where's the hope in the communities. They talked about Ecoria and the universities being committed to social change. And these are young people who are, you know, they're at the university and they're studying and they're engaging the communities in a different kind of way. Um, and they're finding these connections. What is my responsibility as a university student, particularly at a Jesuit university, in response to the people that we're partnering with in the communities? So we just, we wanted to bring their voices into this conversation. Um, one, because they're Salvadoran voices. Two, because they're, they're younger people. Um, and we learned that younger people like to listen more to younger people than to older people. And they just, they're, they're filled with so much wisdom, right? And, and their, their life experiences have formed them in such a way that, that they just have a lot of insight and wisdom. So with that, we'll, we'll close this. I think we'll pass it over to, to Adia. Well, thank you, Trina and Kevin and Francisco. Um, I think we all learned a lot today. And now I wanna open it up for general questions, if anybody has any. And you can drop those in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask yourself, that's fine as well. I have a question. Um, thank you for being here and, and touching on this very important subject. Um, my name is Catherine. I graduated from Fordham in 2019 and currently work in um, development and uni university relations on campus. So while I was a student um, and this year as well, I had the opportunity to participate in IFTJ. And it was a really wonderful experience to learn about the martyrs and, and advocate for social justice issues. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, what other ways would you suggest folks who maybe don't have access to things like IFTJ or folks who aren't students anymore, what ways would you suggest we continue to be involved in the UCA and the missions of IFTJ and just learning about the Jesuit martyrs? I would um, say, well, thank you for your question. Um, I would say there's, you know, nowadays, I think that there are actually a lot of resources to kind of link us up. Um, so, you know, um, within the United States, there's the Ignatian Solidarity Network, and they do amazing work. You know, they just like, they're connectors with 
all kinds of different groups within the Ignatian family, you know? Um, so that's definitely a resource. Um, certainly, CRISPA would be a resource for work that's going on in El Salvador. Um, if you are able to speak Spanish, you know, the UCA has a fantastic website. They put a lot of information up there as well. Um, and I think the Center for Community-Based Learning right there at, uh, uh, on campus at Fordham has, a, you know, so many resources and good people who can, uh, I think, connect you up with a lot of other organizations. I mean, what we're coming to learn, as was mentioned at the beginning, like we're, we're studying this work with the Jesuit Conference. Um, and with the formation of scholastics. So we're doing a deep dive into the whole, and Roxanne has been front and center with guiding us in this, um, but like learning about the different organizations and groups here in the front. And it is really, really impressive. Um, so we're learning a lot and it's an exciting uh, moment to, to be here. But yeah, those would be some things that um, kind of come to mind. And just to piggyback on, on something Kevin said, we, we have connections with several communities. And I think one of the things I love the most about the UCA, this is not so much the case currently, but in the past it was, it was that, that people that probably never finished, uh, you know, elementary school felt like they belonged to the UCA and these communities. Um, they, they were very proud to be connected to the UCA. A lot of these individuals are older now, but continue that legacy and continue to work in different projects and communities. And we can definitely connect you to some of those to just have something like this where we can just chat a little bit uh, or, or have more specific questions about, uh, you know, where this, this inspiration has come from and what it's, uh, what it's doing in their lives today. Thank you, Trina and Kevin and Francisco. Um, and I'm just gonna drop the link for Chris Paz's website on um, in the chat really quickly, if any of you guys want that resource. Um, does anybody else have any questions? The floor is all yours. Um, you can drop them in the chat, or again, you can say them out loud. If maybe just to throw out there, if anyone would like um, more information on kind of like Hope for the Martyrs, 11 years ago uh, at Fordham, uh, a friend of ours, Mark Gravisa, gave a talk on campus. Um, and you can Google it, it just Hope for the Martyrs uh, Fordham, and it'll come up and it's on YouTube and it's also on Fordham site. Um, he goes into depth. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're kind of like, ooh, that was, you know, interesting, I got a taste of this, and you want to go a little bit deeper, uh, I would just kind of uh, reference uh, Mark's talk. Uh, it's quite good. It's on video. I don't want to cut any of the students off if they want to go. So I'll wait a second. But um, I guess this is a general question for anyone, um, Trina, Kevin, or Francisco. Um, we touched a little bit about how the military were influenced, obviously, or were educated by Americans. And, and so I think for me, when I first started learning about the martyrs, um, it was surprising to me about how much we don't know about American influences in other parts of the world and and how our own policies and and political choices as Americans are are having very drastic um, repercussions in, around uh, Latin America in particular right so so could you talk a little bit more about those connections and why it's important for us to to you know, exercise our own civic duties and, and understand what um, our responsibilities are as Americans because of our global influences as well. And I know Francisco, we've talked a lot about this in, in how we, we create presentations for students, but um, could you bring that a little bit um, out further in this conversation so, so that others could make those connections too? 
Well, we, we had a military dictatorship in El Salvador, Salvador that lasted uh, 48 years. And in between, kind of in the middle of that, in the 60s, the U.S. began to have a, a stronger influence in our everyday life and, and politics in general. And a lot of this was done through the School of the Americas. The School of the Americas was a school that was founded in the 40s in Panama and funded by U.S. tax dollars. Uh, U.S. instructors would go and train soldiers there and officers there as well. And the basic idea of this school was to bring soldiers from Latin America, not only El Salvador, and to put it simply, uh, it was to protect U.S. interest in these different countries. So when they would go back, they, they would make sure that these interests were being protected. And they were done through different uh, means. Uh, there are manuals that you can easily find now where torture was taught at these schools. Uh, violence and, and fear was, was taught as, as a tool that needed to be used to keep people in check. Um, there is a specific class in counterinsurgency uh, that was taught where they would put a, an example of fish in a fishbowl, right? So you would have like the whiteboard, let's say, uh, and you would have the fish in the fishbowl and then they would go around the officers that were there. They would ask them, what is the most efficient way to get rid of the fish? Many of them would, would come up with very interesting and uh, creative answers. At the end of the day, they would just be told, no, that's not how we get rid of the fish. The way we get rid of fish is to remove the water, remove the system that provides life, that gives life to the fish. Once that water and that uh, support system is gone, the fish is gone forever. We could add three fish more to that bowl, but it's, it won't survive. They would go on to explain that in order to, to deal with issues of counterinsurgency in communities, what they needed to do is go into communities where people were organizing because they, they began to see that their neighbors were actually suffering because of the injustices that were happening. Uh, and these people began to know who the injustice was coming from and uh, you know, would meet and, and probably in the soccer court, uh, soccer field, and, and you know, they, they would start talking about this and, hey, did you see what happened to to Carla's family, yeah, and did you see what happened to Raul's family? And then people would start raising awareness and individuals became um, uh, leaders in these movements in communities. So in, in this logic that was taught at the School of the Americas of, of the Fish in the Fishbowl, uh, people that were being affected by that raising awareness would call the army to apply this, this tactic that was used. And they would see these people in the communities that were doing the raising awareness as the fish and they would go out after them and eliminate them but they wouldn't stop there they would go and continue with the community because that that was the reason that's where the the motivation the inspiration came from and it was told very simply in communities where you have children you must eliminate the children as well because they are potential rebel fighters they are potential uh guerrillas they're they are potential problems for us and this is how, how the School of the Americas went about and, and taught Latin American soldiers to behave with, with their own uh, you know, citizens and, and fellow brothers and sisters. I know this and, and I like to share this because it, it brings a little bit of, of, of kind of uh, 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 context. Uh, you know, I know this not because I Googled it, not because I, I came across it as uh, you know, in an interesting article. I know this because my father is a former officer of the Salvadoran army who was trained at the School of the Americas twice, once as a cadet and then later as an officer. And this was one of the classes that, that, that he learned from. This uh, teaching was, was continued uh, through many years. My dad was there in the late 60s, but the people that eventually committed the assassination of the Jesuits were also trained at the School of the Americas. So they were trained to do exactly what they did. It wasn't about uh, you know, pe about the Jesuits being in the wrong place at the wrong time, they were seen as the fish, you know, they, they, they were specifically Yaguria was seen as the fish. And uh, one, one of the things that, that, I, that I just want to point out two two things, and I'll, I'll finish this. Um, one of them is that when we look at the example of, of, of a war, 
sometimes we normalize wars because they're not illegal, right? And we think that they're cool and all this other stuff. But for those of you who have seen pictures of, of the, the martyrs and, and what they did to the bodies, uh, I think death is death, regardless of how you put it. But the way that they, they went about uh, killing the martyrs is, 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 is very, it's beyond cruel and I, I can't find a word for it. But one of the things that, that I think is important is that when you look at the bodies and you look at the examples of Selena and Elba, uh, we look, we look at, at, at this idea of collateral damage in wars as, as this acceptable risk that, that can be done to achieve a certain objective. And I think Selena and Elba completely bring a light to that uh, topic or that word that's so dehumanizing. Uh, you know, collateral damage. Uh, Selena and Elba is exactly what collateral damage looks like. And, and, and even that word, sometimes it's very dehumanized when we talk about it. So when uh, those of you who have seen the, the images, uh, uh, think of that, you know, that is exactly what collateral damage is. It isn't this acceptable margin of error uh, in, in, in wars. And the second thing I would like to just point out is that in the role that the US had in our country, uh, there are two sides to it. Uh, one of them is the money that was sent, the training that was sent uh, uh, through the School of the Americas and all that. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we have so many Salvadorans in the US right now is because of US foreign policy as well. Uh, when we talk about immigration, we need to make sure we're doing it in the correct context, not in a vacuum. Uh, we had 94,000 Salvadorans living in the U.S. in 1980. In 1983, there were 700,000 Salvadorans living there. And this was a direct result of U.S. foreign policy. So th there is a, a role to play there that, that has to be uh, addressed when we talk about immigration today. We can't talk about it in a vacuum. And, and the second thing here is that CRISPAS began, CRISPAS is a witness of the solidarity that the people of the United States have shown uh, us. Uh, so I think the people that came in solidarity, people like Kevin and Trina and, and you know, their daughters and so many other uh, foreigners, not only from the US that came to be in solidarity with, with, with us is one of the most beautiful things, specifically in the case of the US, it's one of the most beautiful things the people of the United States have done for us. And as a Salvadoran, it, it is something that I will be eternally grateful for. But we do have these two realities where we had U.S. foreign policy that did so much harm and continues to do so much harm to our country. But it's also important to highlight that we had uh, a bunch of people who put their lives at risk to be in solidarity with, with Salvadorans. Thank you for your answer to that question. Um, does anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask to our speakers? Um, so I'll give you a minute to type them or think them through. There's also a documentary if in case, I, th I think some of you have already seen it, maybe most of, most of you have already seen it, is uh, Blood of the Martyrs. That one's really good. Harvest of Empire is excellent as well. It's an excellent read. So yeah. Um, so if nobody has any more questions, 
Um, I want to give a huge thank you to Trina and Kevin and Francis Francisco for coming in and speaking with us today. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who came as well, everybody in attendance. Um, shout out Raphael. The video was amazing. Um, and I just want to, at the end, add really quickly. Um, this is an event in collaboration between Go Virtual and Common Ground. And um, tomorrow from 11.30 to 2 p.m., Lincoln, um, the Global Outreach Board at Lincoln Center is going to be having coffee hours where you can come ask us questions about future projects, about what's going on in Go, and if you want to apply to a Go project. Um, our spring project participant applications close on December 4th, so if you want to apply to any of those, that application deadline is coming soon. Um, if Frances Francisco or Trina and Kevin have anything else they'd like to add, um, I appreciate it. Otherwise, um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, we're very happy to be here uh, with you all tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and that is it. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, thank you to everybody for speaking today, Francesco and Kevin and Trina once again. Thank you so much and thank you to everybody else in attendance. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Buenas, no Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Okay. Buenas Rafa. noches. Thank you so much everyone. Gracias. Bendiciones. Igual. Bye, Leah. Bye, Will and Nessa. See you all. Yes, yes nice seeing you. Bye, bye, Vanessa. Bye, bye Trina. Bye, Rafa. So yeah. good to okay. see you. Bye, bye, bye. Thanks, Vanessa. Of course, Thanks, Kevin. Aria. Thank you. Good to meet you, Did Trina. Great monitor. Nice to meet you, you too, Vanessa. Nice Thank to meet you. you. Nice meeting all of you guys. You too. Bye, bye. bye. Hey, Carol. All right. Good to see you. Francis, Carol, this is my wife, Trina. Oh, oh, oh Carol. Carol. okay. Okay. All right. Is Carol getting? She works in Kansas. I think we're alone now. <laughs> oh, that's Carol. Okay. okay. Yeah, that was Carol. Oh yeah, yeah. That lady. That's Carol. That lady. Um, Francisco Carol who.